and we'll do a few housekeeping activities and get to the presentation. So I'm calling to order at 7.01. Um, first, we need a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is unanimously. Um, next, I think it might be useful if we have some introductions, both by name and by board affiliation. So I'll begin. I'm Lee Martin. I am the chair of the Menden Upton Regional School Committee. I'm Stephen Metallion, uh, Upton Board of Selectmen. Shaw Craig, Upton Twinko. Mark Real, uh, Menden Board of Selectmen Chair. <coughs> Chris Burke, Menden Board of Selectmen. Mike Morali, Mandy Fincom Chair. Mike yeah, Amanda Fincom. Mike Amanda Leo, Fincom. Sean Nicholson, School Committee and Chair of the Finance Committee. Sandy Packle, Assistant Executive Assistant and Manager Upton. Paul Flaherty, uh, Chair of the Finance Committee. Kelly McCabeth, Town Clerk, Assistant to the Town Manager, and Recording Clerk to the School Committee. I guess I could throw that in there. <laughs> uh, Gary Darty, uh, Chairman, Board of Selectmen for Upton. Good evening, Derek Benizzi, Upton Town Manager. <coughs> Rick McGuire, a FinCom member, Upton. Brett Simons, Upton Board of Selectmen. Nick Sientra, FinCom for Menden. Jack Hodgins, Menden FinCom. Uh, Phil Desutter, uh, Upton Menden Regional School Committee. Chris Kelly, Richard, Inside. Could you love it from the school committee? Sorry. Norm Brown, Mendon, Finkham. Brian Guzman, Mendon, Finkham. Heather Alcock, Mendon, Finkham. Okay. Uh, Vicki Ludwigson has volunteered to be recording secretary. So, uh, okay. And I will turn it over to Dr. Ruschek. All right. Hi, I'm Joe Baruschak. I'm the su proud superintendent of schools. I do it all. I'm also the chief bottle washer. Um, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for being here. Um, I know a lot of, of you have been uh, doing your public service for quite some time. Um, it's good to have these meetings again. I think it's been at least a couple years where um, we, we used to meet on a regular basis. Uh, as the agenda says, as the multi-board, which really was kind of an open meeting of anybody on the FinCom, Board of Selectmen, and the Regional School Committee. And I think uh, a lot of good came out of the three or four years that that really was uh, something that was vital. Um, in addition to just the budgetary piece and having that ongoing consistent dialogue, Looking at multiple vehicles uh, for savings and efficiencies was also a critical piece. So I'm, I'm delighted uh, that we've reconvened, and I'm really happy that all of you are here. Um, you should have in your packet um, one glossy document that has that uh, on the cover. It's known as Inspire. Um, keep in mind that I, I, I'm a big believer during my eight-year tenure here uh, that you really have to have a strategic plan as your kind of your north star of what is going to guide your uh, initiatives, what's going to guide your priorities. Okay, we've had the opportunity um, just recently in the spring, going into the early summer, we had a committee of about 45 parents. Students put together this document in, in spital, uh, entitled Inspire uh, as our new strategic plan. And you'll see a lot of the ideas that are really crucial to what we want to achieve as a regional school district and build upon those successes in that document. So I invite you to peruse it uh, at your leisure. Our regional school committee, uh, as you probably know, has a budget subcommittee, and every year during our first meetings, we talk about what, um, what are our priorities. Uh, I, I'm a strong believer that uh, a solid budget is based upon a foundation of goals. So we have three simple goals of our budget. First and foremost, to provide the academic and social emotional services that all, need, uh, all learners need to thrive. 
And that's really a, a, a key piece of our mission statement. We have a, a simple, very concise, very succinct mission statement that our mission is to provide opportunities so all learners can thrive. All learners, all students, pre-K through 12, but also as a community learners, even the adults within our organization. Secondly, something that, uh, again, is in our strategic plan to provide programs and services that address uh, the portrait of a graduate uh, competencies. If you go through it, you'll see six overall competencies or goals that we expect all kids to be able to achieve upon graduating. It's a very forward-thinking idea, but it's also an organize, organize, organizing principle in which we are planning backwards all of our curriculum and our instruction. And then last but not least, and I always say that this is our perennial goal, to always look at what we're doing and how can we be more efficient about it and to maximize those efficiencies and always to aggressively uh, pursue cost savings. So you'll see in the, also in the strategic plan these five overall beliefs about what our kids need to learn deeply, to learn in a significant manner. And again, these come from our community. These come from parents. These come from community members that say the simple question, what kind of systems do we need in place? What kind of relationships do we need in place? What type of conditions do we need in place so all kids can learn powerfully and deeply? And you can see establishing relationships in a safe, inclusive, supportive environment, nurturing curiosity, discovering interests, pursuing passions, having opportunities so kids can be active, creative, purposeful, and also reflective, providing authentic experiences, not only inside, but outside of the classroom, and then uh, super, super important, meaningful collaboration amongst all of our stakeholders within our communities. Again, not my words, came directly from our strategic planning committee. So uh, I'm proud to say, and uh, you know, again, I, I, I wasn't being facetious at all by saying I'm super proud to be superintendent of this district based upon what we've been able to achieve, the things that we've been able to achieve in concert with all of you, in concert with people working together. Um, We've had a clear focus on, you'll see this abbreviation, SEL, social emotional learning, uh, within the last three or four years. And it kind of speaks to the things that we do in our um, schools to promote social emotional growth in our students. Okay, I, it's probably not a mystery to all of you sitting around the table that we've got increased challenges uh, within our schools. And I think it's not just Menden and Upton, it's something that is uh, happening all across our country. There's increased instances of mental health issues, anxiety, depression, uh, a whole host of other issues. And really, providing supports for students is super critical, but then also, providing that proactive approach, being very, very explicit in starting in kindergarten up in providing explicit instruction in pro-social behavior. And that's very, very actively happening at our two elementary schools. We've had an emphasis in the last two years on meaningful project-based learning, okay? Learning in a meaningful way is a lot more than taking a standardized test like the MCAS or at the high school level, the SATs and AP tests. So again, so our students make meaning of their learning is critical. Um, hopefully you've heard, uh, again, kind of speaking to that whole piece that we've done in recent years around finding efficiencies. Uh, we're proud to say about 90% of our energy, with our, our electricity here in the district, comes from renewable sources. Uh, you probably, anytime you've driven past Misco Hill, you see the solar panels. We also have some external sites 
in which we're do, uh, using. And because of that piece, along with the educational piece of what we're teaching kids, we're one of uh, seven districts that in 2018 was recognized by the US Department of Ed as a green ribbon district for our commitment to sustainability. Something that we've been working on at least the last five or six years is the inclusion model, which kind of essentially speaks to how we deliver special education services. We do not use uh, a pullout model for the overwhelming majority of our students who have IEPs or individualized education plans. Rather, we have uh, special educators working in a team type setting with regular educators. And then unprecedented success um, across the board. Okay, if you were to look uh, in the last two or three years, in the last two years, um, Nipmuc Regional High School has been honored as one of the top 500 high schools across the country uh, by Newsweek magazine, also by US News and World Report. It's a, civil, uh, a silver medalist. The high school has also been recognized uh, as a commended school by uh, the uh, Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education based upon MCAS scores, but also based upon um, the growth over time. Um, I think if you have kids in the district or you've paid attention to things like where we've been as far as athletics within the last two years, uh, having state soccer champions in boys soccer. Uh, it was a thrill this year for the first time in the history of the program. We played in the Super Bowl and our kids were able to go to Gillette. It was, you know, wish it was a different result, but just the fact of that experience of our kids going, um, it really kind of speaks to, again, you and the support of our community uh, in able to keep, keep this momentum going. So as I do every year, um, I take a look at what is our enrollment and what is our projected enrollment for the coming year. And we use the official October 1st uh, numbers. So you see uh, for this current year, we're at uh, 2333. Kind of ironically enough, I, I, I've got to be 100% honest with you guys, I use a uh, a company known as NESDEC, which is the New England Staff Development Council, they do the enrollment projections for us. And each of the last two years, they predicted a decline in enrollment. And actually, in the last two years, we've had an increase of 70 students. So, um, But there's really two pressure points. There's two points that you have to look at. It's real, real simple. It's how many kids are entering as kindergartners, how many kids are graduating? I actually should say three. But then the matriculation rate from eighth grade to uh, ninth grade. How many of our eighth graders are applying and then going to BVT or a private or parochial school? And how many end up here as ninth graders? We've had a trend. We've had a trend within the last uh, two years particularly, which has been one of these points, of um, about 170 of the 200 uh, uh, eighth graders have matriculated from uh, MISCO to NETMUC. That's been an upward trend. We've had uh, as low as 135, 140, and we've pretty much been consistent in these classes of around 200. We're starting to see, uh, the, looking at the live birth rate within the two communities, um, it declined, and it's been a, a, a very gradual decline. However, the, the kids coming in as kindergartners this year uh, will be born in 2014. There's a spike in 2015. I don't know what happened that year, what was in the water, or what the story is with that, um, but we do have a spike. Um, we're looking at a, a decrease of, in the ballpark of a little under 40 students, and a big chunk of that decrease is the number of fourth grade students that we have that will matriculate over to uh, MISCA. 
it's approximately about a, a loss of about 35 students uh, in this year's fourth grade class versus this year's fifth grade class. As far as the breakdown, as far as distribution, which determines the assessment to the two communities, um, that's virtually unchanged. It might have changed by literally something like a tenth of a percentage point, but proportionally, the populations <coughs> have been consistent. Yeah, please interrupt me. Yeah, that Gary. District, is that the amount of kids coming from another district to our district, or what we're saying is the out-of-district The out-of-district, out great question, Gary. That, those are students that are Menden and Upton students that are being sent out for special education purposes to receive specialized instruction that, because of significant disabilities, that we don't have those programs to serve them. And all 31? Huh? All 31 of them? Correct. Absolutely. Um, so if you look at our average class sizes, um, we've been consistently in a pretty good place. As you can <laughs> see uh, at our elementary schools, we're about 20, 21. Uh, that tends to be a little bit smaller in your early elementary grades, K through 2, and a little bit higher in three and four. Uh, right around that 24, 25 mark uh, at Misco Hill and right at 21, 22 here at the high school. So um, I've got a lot of things to talk about with regard to different possibilities for the FY20 budget. Um, Initially, in, in taking a look at this and looking at, okay, what are the things that we need for level services to keep the existing programs and staff, plus things that are targeted uh, expenditures, targeted investments, uh, our initial proposal is for a 5.43 increase which translates to $37,273,111. And um, we're very, very confident that this would maintain level services and address some targeted needs, which I'm going to talk about in a, a couple minutes. And again, maintaining those class sizes and then, again, going back to the strategic plan, talking about the things that we um, would really like, we think are important investments, particularly around social emotional learning. So what are the drivers? Obviously the two, there's always, as you know in your budget, the two largest things are salaries and uh, benefits. So all of our collective salary increases translates to, bless you Paul, um, $644,132 uh, and that includes all of the steps and lanes that go for uh, our professional staff but pretty much across the board the cost of living increase and this will be uh, the third year of a three-year contract for all five of our associations pretty much across the board is a 2.25 percent COLA. Um, our uh, drivers on the benefits side is, it's, is the largest is health care insurance. Right now in that budget, we've got a 5% increase. Um, we're, we're still in the process of trying to negotiate with Harvard Pilgrim Health. Right now their latest quote to us is a 4.9% increase. We strongly feel that this is really unreasonable. Um, just to not really get into the weeds of this, last year we took a 0% increase with a 79% utilization rate. This year we're at an 82% utilization rate. So relatively speaking, in my humble opinion, we're healthy. <laughs> um, but that is something that's still ongoing. Uh, it's my understanding from both of our communities, we've been, uh, you've been feeling the same pain with us as far as your assessment to Worcester County retirement. We did get our uh, assessment slightly bef uh, right after the holidays, I believe it was, Jed, and it's an 11.7% increase, which translates 
to uh, 80, a little under 83,000. Transportation, uh, again, will be in our third year of our three-year contract with Telstone and Sons, which is our transportation provider. Uh, it's a little under a 5% increase for that last year, which translates to 80,735. And then something that is super, super challenging, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is our special education transportation. Significant increase there, which is actually more than our regular ed transportation. And uh, a good chunk of that kind of speaks to that slide that Gary asked me about, about students that are out of district placements, okay? So you could have a student who's in a highly specialized program that is receiving that program in Rentham or in Newton. You know, and, and you, you do what you can to be as efficient as you can, but realize the district is responsible for all of those expenses for transportation back and forth. Okay, we do what we can to be efficient in partnering with our neighbors in Oxbridge and Milford and so on. But that gets to be very, very costly. And there is absolutely no mechanism for any reimbursement from the state for that whatsoever. And we're completely on the hook for that. Um, student services, we, uh, again, this is an issue where, uh, as the regional school district, when we have students that apply to Norfolk Aggie uh, for their program in, it could be animal science or agricultural uh, science, we're on the hook for those tuitions and also the transportation back and forth there as well. Okay, we absorb that cost. It doesn't go to the towns. Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, it's approximately 23, 24,000 per student. For Norfolk Avenue, yes. Yeah. yeah. So we've had an explosion, and then some of this kind of speaks to, and I know some of you are veterans, and we've talked about this in the past, we've had an explosion with students who did not get into BVT, who acts, who then as their choice B, they opt for Norfolk Aggie. Um, and again, we absorb that, but my first year as superintendent in 2011, I think we had all of two students, and now it's kind of ballooned up to about 15, 16 students. So that's obviously a stressor as well. Um, out of district tuition, a 10.6% in, uh, increase. Um, you see that, that has to do with some of our shifting expenses of uh, placements of students either graduating out or aging out of their programs, but then some new placements in. Realize the range of out of district placements ranges anywhere from the low end of about 55,000 to student up to over $200,000 per student. Building and grounds, uh, increase of 62,370. Most of this kind of speaks to maintenance and some of the issues that we've had with upkeeping our boilers, particularly at Misco Hill. We've had some real challenges with that. Um, and also something that we're always super cognizant of, that there's a lot of regulatory pieces, is the water system at, particularly in Menden, at Clough and um, Misco, where because they're well based, keeping on top of some of the regulations uh, of purity. So, tech now. Uh, sure, on that last slide. Sure. The steps and lanes, presumably that's the 1% increase above the two and a quarter. <coughs> Correct. And does that get distributed? How does that get distributed? Is so, great. Uh, super question. Um, it's based upon um, longevity, and it's also based upon have they earned their master's degree, have they earned master's plus 15, have they earned master's plus 30, and so on. And then it's all, it's literally almost like, a, a, the reason they call it steps is it looks like a step system, because it's based upon years of service. So it goes from year one as a brand new teacher 
all the way to year 13 as a 13 year veteran. So if you've been in our district or you've been a teacher for 13 years, assuming you haven't earned additional degrees, you're getting that 2.25. So it's 10 year credential. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, technology. If I could just ask one other thing, I sure see that you. the increment of the 644,000, what does that bring? So on that page, what would those total summations be? So if wages change by 644,000, what's the total of wages? If we have an increase to Worcester County retirement, what's that total payment look like? So I, I browsed through this budget, but I didn't see the totals. So Worcester yeah. County has nothing to do with teacher salaries. Those salary increases are everybody, not just teachers, custodians. It's everybody in the district. Teachers all pay into an MTRS system. The district contributes nothing to that. So Worcester County is a separate thing. The 644 reflects individual increases for all of our employees. There's about 430 of them based on where they are, the steps length, what their COLAs are, or what they've negotiated in their contracts. Does that answer your question? Or no? Not exactly. Okay. So the question actually is, what is the total salary? I understand that it's a very, you know, various from administrators to teachers oh, to groundskeepers. Total, total dollar value of salaries? Yeah, what would be the total dollar value there if we have an increase of Worcester County retirement of 82796 What's the total payment to Worcester County retirement? Oh, it's about, uh, I'll tell you in a second, but I want to say it's about seven hundred ninety. dollars it's, it's probably, if you look, Steve, in that document, how it's broken down by cost centers. Can I steal yours for a second, Chris? I'm not sure what the county is separated out, but I can tell you one second. Total salaries is about $22 million. <laughs> okay. um, let me get you the Worcester County in one second. Okay. <laughs> Worcester County, our assessment is seven hundred and seventy-eight thousand one hundred eight dollars. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Um, as far as technology, we've had a significant uh, investment in technology uh, across all of our elementary schools. Um, in every single classroom, you see a smart board like this. Uh, in addition in many of our classrooms in the middle school and then we also have um, our one-to-one -one initiative uh, here at the high school and the middle school all of our technology lines are essentially level funded and then uh, this next piece kind of speaks to what our targeted needs are um, at this present time we do not have uh, any school psychologists on staff. So as a matter of fact, uh, anything that has to be done that's in the milieu of psychological testing, we contract out. Okay, we have, we consider that to be a purchase service. Um, we have a line item of about $100,000 just for that testing. We think it would be a smarter investment to go with 2.0 FTEs of full-time school psychologists, one for our two schools in Menden, one for our two schools in Upton, uh, eliminating that line item of the purchase service for a net cost of, of $60,000. So they could do the psychological testing, but also provide services uh, to students. Um, yeah? What's the benefit cost of these two people? Um, Great question. Probably uh, depending on their individual, if they are uh, an individual plan or a family plan. Uh, worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, family plan, uh, plan uh, fifteen thousand. A piece. A piece. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, that one sixty is actually one ninety. Depends where we hire them. Depends where they hire them. Okay, that 80 per head builds in. Okay, so if I were to hire somebody relatively young, around 50 to 60,000, it's built in. I thought you were going to say 50 being 50 well, years Well, 50, 50 yeah. is very young, okay? I'm going to say it up front, guys. I'm good, Dad. You're good with that, right? I am. Okay. Um, right now, we have a situation where um, 
we have three team chairs that uh, operate our special education services and coordinate everything with our families and with uh, the service providers. Uh, they're kind of unequally distributed and the mindset is to hire one additional but also to reconstitute uh, the position so that each of our elementary schools have their own team chair but they also work in a dean of students capacity working closely with students and their families. Okay, and again, it, it ties into that whole piece around social emotional supports for our families. Um, then uh, an increase in a health wellness teacher at our middle school. Okay, something that we, we were in the process, we started last year changing the schedule um, because we had a reality of we had kids going through four years of middle school who never accessed health, wellness, or PE class, okay? And uh, it's a problem on a whole bunch of different levels, and part of it was just the structure of the schedule was kids had to choose a foreign language, or they had to choose band or chorus, and so on. So we made some tweaks to the schedule, and now we're in a place where we can guarantee every single kid is getting at least one quarter of health or wellness. We want to expand that. We want to make sure that every kid is getting half a year of wellness all throughout their four years. If we make that investment in that health wellness teacher, then we can do it. Keep in mind, built into the staffing is the reduction of 2.0 FTEs, one of which would be at the elementary level and one of which would be at the middle school level to compensate for what I showed you in that first slide, the projected enrollment <coughs> increase of somewhere in the ballpark of about 35 students. Okay, so the net gain of FTEs, the targeted investment is 4.0, but the net gain is actually 2.0. Okay. And the net increases, if I follow the math, Joe, is 95, correct? Huh? And if I follow the math, the net increase is 95, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Sir? Yes. The uh, reduction, is that support staff or teacher staff? It would be teaching staff. Be teaching staff. Is that, are you doing that because of enrollment? Or? Because of enrollment, Gary. Enrollment. It, it really, it, it, it's a reduction, but in the big picture, also kind of a redeployment. Okay. So uh, again, looking at this based upon strictly uh, expenditures, uh, like I said before, you're talking about a 5.43% increase or $1.9 million. Um, so here's the truly depressing news. Opposite side of the house, the revenue, we, uh, at this time of the year, all we have to work with is the governor's budget or the house one budget. And um, we're actually looking at less revenue for FY20 than FY19, okay? We've been a district, and uh, there's a lot of districts across the Commonwealth that gets the absolute bare minimum, and the absolute bare minimum is $20 per student. And um, that translates to $44,020. We have two major strands of state funding. It is uh, Chapter 70, that's the student aid. But then being a regional school district, we get regional uh, transportation reimbursement. In the governor's budget, we actually have less funds because it was completely level funded, okay? So the decrease that's shown in the cherry sheet is actually um, 46,000 and then a, a minor funding stream is uh, charter school reimbursement between our two communities I believe we only have what is it J five students five or, six. five or six that access charter schools we get a very small amount of reimbursement we have to pay their tuitions again the regional school district absorbs that so our actual uh, comparison of FY 20 
FY19 is actually $744 less in state aid. So therefore, once again, as we've been in um, years, the burden uh, falls to our two local communities. Something that I, whoops, I'm sorry. Something that I do want to point out um, is our minimum local contribution, which again is what the state formula says should be the increase based upon the foundation budget formula is uh, fairly significant increases to both communities. So to Menden, it's 502,751. And to Upton, it's 604,348. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the specifics with regard to uh, the formula. So as you can see, as a result, um, in looking at strictly expenditures, you've got a very, very significant increase in operational assessment. And I'm very cognizant of that. 928,687 to Menden and 1.1 million, 1,127,665 to Upton. Um, in making the budget work every year, we also uh, look at our, how we fund from something known as E&D, or excess and deficiency, which is essentially our free cash. Um, we are appropriating 300,000 from E&D, which is 1,000, 100,000 less than this current fiscal year. Um, and the reason being that our E&D was actually certified at a smaller amount this year than last year. And again, we keep that as, for lack of a better term, a nest egg, because it kind of speaks to the district solvency, but it also, in the <coughs> event that we have a move in of an out of district placement, and we're, lo and behold, we're hit with a tuition bill of 150, 200,000, as has happened in the past, we have that uh, to rest on. Joe? Yeah. What is the total ending? Um, I certified ending. 850,000 approximately, like it's changed. Yeah, and we just, uh, they were a little bit late this year. We just got it within the last month or so, right? So again, looking at strictly an expenditure based increase a 5.43% increase, which would be uh, a significant increase uh, both to Menden and to uh, Upton, which I, I told you those numbers. And then as you can see, the 5.43% overall operational budget. So kind of looking at, all right, what would it look like if we built a budget not strictly based upon expenditures, but based upon just what the state is saying for a minimum local contribution increase. OK. Uh, so for Menden, you're still talking about uh, a operational increase of 502,751. And for Upton, you're talking about an increase of 592,771, both over 5%. But again, because of the dearth of state funding, overall increase to the operational budget for the regional school district is about 2.5%. So uh, this is something that I've talked about, and I usually talk about. Uh, every single year when I present to the two FinComs individually is this whole notion of target share. And target share is directly tied to the MLC or the minimum local contribution for each community. Um, and it kind of speaks to, okay, where, what are they doing in coming up with these numbers for the foundation budget and what communities should pay? And uh, every year, they look at two things. What are your aggregate property values in the community? And what is your aggregate personal income level 
Okay, and together they're known as MRGF, which stands for Municipal Revenue Growth Factor. Um, and that's really kind of the crux of when the state tweaked its funding formula, now kind of dated in 2007, now we're talking 13 years ago, um, to look at target shares. So again, in the, in, in the big scheme of things, and they recalculate this each and every single year, the goal overall is that 59% of uh, budgets should be covered by the municipality and 41% covered by state aid, okay? Um, but keep in mind, based upon the wealth of the community, there is, it varies. So the lowest is Lawrence. They continue to be the poorest, statistically the poorest community. So Lawrence is only on the hook for 14% of their budget, according to the formula. And there's a bunch of communities, I think the nearest one is Hopkinton, that are at the cap. And they cap it at 82.5%. Okay, so you can see the, all of our neighbors and the relative wealth that for this coming year, according to the state funding formula, that's the percentage that they should be paying for public education, for K through 12 public education for all the kids in their community. And I'm always very, very careful to realize for Menden and Upton, we really only have three sources that go into the formula. Us, the regional school district, BVT, and again, Norfolk Ag. But keep in mind, we subsume Norfolk Ag. We pay out those tuitions. Um, so you see the percentages. So the question is, where does Menden and Upton fall? For FY20, Menden is at 74.64% for target share, and Upton is 73.86. So almost statistically, according to the state funding formula and MRGF, the two communities are very, very similar from a wealth perspective using uh, that formula. Then what they do is they say, okay, let's look at your FY19 contribution and what is your actual percentage. And you can see there for Menden, 71.89, for Upton, 68.71, okay? So there are two communities that are still below target share, okay? And of the 351 communities across the Commonwealth, about 15%, 57 communities um, are below their target share. We're two of those 57, okay? Um, <coughs> we in the past, as the regional school committee, we invite our four reps, and we'll do it again this spring, to come and kind of speak about it and kind of advocate for uh, the state funding to improve we had a former rep who has since retired who really pulled no punches with us and said, well, you know, with all due respect, you're still to the communities that, um, you're still two communities that are below your target share. You know, there, there's communities, uh, unfortunately, that are well above it. You know, I can, I can tell anecdotes. When the cherry sheets came out, uh, I'm good friends with the superintendent of Ashland. I'm friends with the superintendent of Auburn. I can tell you Ashland got an additional $1.7 million in state aid. He is not worrying at all. He has a very different conversation uh, with the school committee than I do. I can tell you Auburn got about an additional $700,000 in state aid. Why? There are two communities that are upwards of about 10, 11% above their target share. Okay. Uh, some of this, uh, to be very, very fair uh, for our communities, that I think is very unfair, is they recalculate this every single year. Okay. I know a, a lot of you, you guys that have been around this table for a couple years, right? Too long. Too I didn't say that, Mike. Um, I can go back to my first year when I was presenting the FY12 budget, and those numbers were like high 50s, low 60s. 
I could pull back my old PowerPoints. So it's constantly a moving target, and it's about relative wealth throughout the Commonwealth. Um, but they do recalculate it every single year. So um, we've got, obviously, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very cognizant of the, the fiscal realities within our two communities. Um, this, this, this is a sizable uh, budget. And uh, we still have some variables, but to be 100% honest with you, they're not very, you know, I, I, I don't see an 11th hour miracle happening. Okay, I'm very frustrated to say the least about our health insurance uh, renewal rate. Perhaps we can get some improvement on that. We will consistently uh, be working on that, but we had a very challenging meeting last week. Um, we always have conservative estimates. We still have to see what our numbers are going to be like as far as how many Norfolk Aggie students are going to, um, how many of our eighth graders are going to apply, how many are going to be accepted, how many are going to actually matriculate. I believe we have five four or five, there are five that are slated to graduate, okay? So that's a piece of change. We conservatively budget five replacements, okay? Um, typically things improve in the House and the Senate budgets, as you guys know, and Chapter 70 usually is. I can honestly say in my tenure, the worst that we've ever done is about an additional 600, uh, I wish it was 600,000, uh, an additional 60,000. The best we've ever done is about an additional 180, okay? Um, and then there's always an 11th hour. I get the letter in May or June, oh, by the way, I'm retiring. It's, I, it's been a wonderful career, okay? This builds in, I believe, three retirements, Jay, that we already know of, that they've already given us their letter and we've replaced them with a staff member uh, at a lower cost. So um, we, we've got a significant uh, gap, and uh, what I prepared for you, and in kind of thinking this out with the Regional School Committee and with uh, Jay Beyer, our business manager, uh, really are three <coughs> options for consideration. And if you look in your packet, um, I believe there's a sheet, it's just a one-pager that kind of talks, and it's got three different boxes about some potential different options. One being what I presented to you, uh, the full funding based upon level services and targeted investments. Uh, a second option um, would be, and, and, and I apologize for, um, <laughs> this is a little confusing, it really, option two on my slide really is, is what, what option one should be, would be saying, okay, we're going to be strictly level service, keeping existing staff and so on, um, but pushing some things with regard to our choice appropriation, um, and counting on an additional $100,000 in state aid, and then um, looking at um, cutting our individual supply line items to below level funded where we are for this year. That gets us about an additional 74000 And then eliminating those positions that I discussed, eliminating a, for a consideration, the two school psychologists, uh, the SPED team chair slash dean of students, and the wellness teacher. Um, and that comes out to reducing uh, an additional 581,530. And then option three, which again, I apologize on this sheet, is listed as option two, um, would be basically doing everything that I described in that previous option and probably eliminating about eight to 10 positions because we would see that uh, 
you would have an additional gap to that 400, 429,300 cuts. And essentially that gets you to the place of what I described in those slides of increases based upon the minimum local contribution increase in contribution. And you see uh, what's been itemized there that what it would mean would be an additional 502,751 from Menden, an additional 592,771 uh, from Upton. So as you can see, it's, it's not exactly a, a, a pretty picture. Um, I kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't prioritized or wrapped my head around this. I think unfortunately it would represent a regression in some of the forward progress that we've made as a school district. Um, I think in some places, not necessarily across the board, you'd be talking about some increased class sizes and uh, loss of some necessary services. I think when push comes to shove, there's some things that statutorily, particularly around in the milieu of special education, you have to provide. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, you do everything that you can to preserve your instructional core of your individual classroom teacher and children. Um, so then you start to look at peripheral things. So peripheral things that we make gains in. Things like reading instructors. Things like um, potentially uh, counselors or people who are working with kids here at the high school around career development and so on. So it becomes a, a, a very, very uh, difficult piece. So I think that's where we are right now. Again, as you guys know, still at a relatively early stage of this process. Um, but I think when push comes to shove, it really does come back to our strategic plan and the vision that is embedded within that plan that we want all of our kids to be successful, we want all of our kids to be highly proficient in all content areas, we want all of our kids to be safe, we want all of our kids to be healthy. When push comes to shove, we want all of our kids to thrive. Um, so that's where we are right now. Um, you, know, you guys know the whole timeline we're relatively close. We're in the ballpark of around two weeks from the regional school committee uh, 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 approving, uh, uh, certifying a budget. Keep in mind, the number that they certify can always go down. It cannot go up, as hopefully you know. Um, but we're in a, to be very, very frank with you, we're in a very, very difficult place. Um, something that I have a lot of pride in, in, in Part of me being happy in my position, but also a lot of pride in working in this community is the sense of partnership and sense of collaboration. Um, I had the opportunity when I was interviewing for this position, and unfortunately it was kind of in the height of the recession when I saw that there was a lot of rancor <laughs> and there was a lot of discontent and it really fired up uh, our parent base and so on. I never ever want to return to those days and I think probably everybody in this room would never ever want to return to those days. I'd like, to, you know, my mantra has been since I've been superintendent, no drama. And um, it's my hope that we can work out some type of constructive solution that um, sustains the school district but also is cognizant of the challenges and the constraints that you guys face as well in both of our communities. So uh, I'll get off my soapbox, and if anybody has any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Chris. Sure, just real quick, um, just so that I'm clear, in option one, two, and three, are you calculating based off of the minimum local contribution, um, or were you looking at target share? Options. Uh, all three of them, yes. Realize option three is the bare minimum based upon what the state is mandating, as, is, so is proposing as far as MLC. Okay, but also if I 
if you correctly, option one and two is <clears throat> closer to target share then? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure that was clear. Is it meeting target share in option one and two? Uh, hard to say. Okay. Hard to say. <coughs> Brett. Thanks. Do you ever, uh, I'm sure you do, do you share a five year plan? I know you have the five year vision that you've pulled together and that is really important. Do you do a five year analysis or sort of pro forma on your yeah, finances? Yeah, that's, that, that's a true question. In the past, we've done a five year um, projection, uh, a very, very sketchy projection. And we did it through the multi board of the um, finances of what the operational budget would look like. I think it's very, very challenging seeing we don't have the contract. You know, next year will be a negotiation year. We could project projected colas, um, but you always have variables. You know, and again, your two biggest drivers are your salaries and the health care insurance, and they can be grossly variant. You know, we we. You know, I, I had the luck of the Irish, even though I'm only 25% Irish. Uh, my first three years, I got lucky, and we had three straight years of 0% increases. And then, like, my fifth year, we got whacked with, like, an 11% increase. So you guys know what you're dealing with as well. So there's a lot of variability. We could project it out, but it would just be kind of a model. But in, the, in trying to do that, you still got this target share yeah. that's... Constantly moving time. And, and it's, uh, to be 100% honest with you, Paul, it's maddening. Absolutely maddening. Joe, if you were to uh, look at option one and two and um, target those more at MLC, um, what would that be adjustment be? Because that might be a contributor of when the towns debate this. <clears throat> if, uh, if we look at MLC and those numbers drop a little bit, we might be more apt to look at another Um, I think, I, I, again, there's still variables to play out, but I can guarantee you as we go through the House budget and the Senate budget, that minimum local contribution increase will not change. No, but, but what you're doing is, is in option one and two, what I heard you say is, um, you're going more towards target share. Yeah, because so, because you're contributing more. You're contributing more. So what I'm saying is, is that is there a way to adjust that down to make that those one of those other two options? More no, more? because uh, we don't control those numbers. And, and believe it or not, and we kind of talked a little bit about this at the budget subcommittee level and also at the regional school committee level. Um, we we've gone with a formula to kind of make things work within our community, okay? So if you look at the increase in minimum local contribution, here it's 7.47%. I'm not gonna lie to you, that, that's, that's big. And for Menden, it's, it's also big, 7.51%. So to kind of put this in a real simple term, um, you can go back, it's on the website, and look at my presentation from last year. Last year, it was six, it, it, it wasn't that high, but it was still significantly higher. So realize, the state in the funding formula, the reason that they keep increasing the minimum local contribution is because we're still below on the target share. So. What I can tell you is, if you go back and look at what the minimum local contribution was last year for FY19, the year before FY18, FY17, I can guarantee you both communities' contributions were below it. Okay, and it, and it kind of was like, all right, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make it work, and that was part of our commitment, and it continues to be our commitment. But realize what the state has done in this target share formula 
is they've said to the communities that are below, oh, by the way, if you're one of these 57 communities, we're also going to push by a percentage point in increment to get you closer to MLC. We're going to add a, a full percentage point to your increase in MLC. To get to. Exactly. To and Upton was so far behind, I think it was three or four years ago, they actually, it was a 2% increase that they added to it. So um, it is what it is. I, I, I see both sides of the fence. I think part of it is maddening. I think part of it is the reality of our communities and the resources and the tax base and so on. I mean, it's, it's this whole larger conversation. But that's where we are, and I think when push comes to shove, it's a conversation about what are the quality of the schools, what are the types of programs and services that we want for our children. Mike. Joe, did I understand you to say that uh, this budget is the last, you'll have to renegotiate contracts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, next year. So for FY21, will be the start of new three-year contracts. So there's, there's an unknown there. I'm just looking at the future. Absolutely. So there's an unknown there. Absolutely. So that, sal that salary that you added in was a known figure you've known Correct. for three years. Correct. Quick question. Yes, Steve. Um, I see on the revenue side of the ledger here, um, what are we currently receiving now for incoming school choice students? Great question. What is that? So mean? at present time, I believe we have about 162 students choicing in, and we only have about 35 choicing out. So it's an even exchange, Steve. We get for every kiddo that comes into our district $5,500. And for every kid that goes out, we get $5,500, OK? Um, one thing that you have to realize with choice is, hopefully I'm applying the right <laughs> law. It's kind of the law of diminishing returns. You've got to be very, very careful about it. Because if you take in too many choice students, you, it actually becomes a losing proposition, because you're only getting $5,500 per kid. And the reality is, for all of our kids, it costs 13, 14,000 bucks per student. You try to do it targeted in, in places where it makes sense, where you say, OK, I got a class of 21 here. I can go up to 24. I can go up to 23. So I'll take two there. So you try to do it in a smart fashion. We generally have the heaviest amount here at the high school. Okay, because of the nature of the schedule, you can take <coughs> kids in. Uh, we've got a real dichotomy between our two communities. We've got a lot more students that are choiced into Clough than are, that are choiced into <coughs> Memorial. And not to make a judgment, but it's basically look at your neighboring communities. Okay, in Upton, you have at least a couple communities that have very good reputations for their school districts. Whereas in Menden, you've got a couple challenged communities. At that age, student choicing in, is the trend that they continue to choice in all the way right up the ladder? OK, so <laughs> great question. You own them for life. So you accept them from kindergarten. You own them until <coughs> they either graduate or turn 21. <laughs> or choose to leave. <laughs> or choose to leave. And it can't be, it's got to be a completely blind, non-discriminatory process, Mike. So there's times where I have heart-to-hearts with our principal at Clough, and I put the brakes on certain things because, again, it's a balancing act. And it is a really, really good thing that we've got a nice delta in the number of kids choicing in versus choicing out. But you've got to be super careful, OK? Our neighbor. Right next door, Uxbridge, the Uxbridge superintendent has a $2 million line item in his budget to pay for choicing out. Okay, We are just the opposite, that we can use that as a district receipt to help defray the assessments to our two That's communities. A much bigger school system. 
Huh? That's a much bigger school system, isn't it? Us? No, no, he only has about 1,300 students. Really? Yeah. And part of his problem is the choice out and also gets very hit very hard by VBT. This compares, Joe, to the past five years or so. I know I asked about the future five years, but I know we can look back. And for me, some of what's lost is the context, but I'm new, so I don't, okay. I haven't been looking at this, right? I'm brand new sure. to this. It's my first year seeing any of these data and looking at them sort of deeply. So from your experience, two questions. One, you know, how does this increase compare with prior years? It sounds like it's relatively in line a little bit on the higher side. It's on the higher side. It is. It's clearly on the higher side because uh, uh, we've had many, many years where the increase that we've gone to the two communities have been very, very modest. Been in the ballpark of around 2%. I can tell you, I'll never forget, my very first year as superintendent, our increase was 0.68%. And it was a smart thing to do because uh, our two communities were really, really taxed. And again, there's certain things that I got really lucky with. It's good to get lucky with a 0% increase in health care. I literally, I, you know, I, think I, I don't think I'm betraying confidence, but that first year, part of balancing uh, the budget was literally a young man who was an out-of-district placement who graduated from his placement. And I found out on like May 15th, he was good to go to graduate, and his tuition was $168,000. That's some of what we live with and what we deal with. And again, I don't say that in any type of disparaging way. I'm a big believer in the expression, but for the grace of God, go I. These are all of our kids, and all of our kids have different needs. But realize these are some of the things that are financial stressors that drive some of these increases. Sir? Um, tell me to put you on the spot. No. Commentary on uh, the funding formula um, where we're for regional school districts. Yeah. So by definition, we are more efficient because we're regional. Yeah. Yet the funding doesn't seem to reflect that efficiency in the sense that we get piled in with Standalone schools. It seems I couldn't totally agree more. One of the things I, I think one of the uh, consistent messages and themes that I hear from my regional superintendent colleagues, but also uh, the school committee colleagues, uh, is really we've got a lot of places where it's a promise unkept. For example, under the state law, we're supposed to be funded for regional transportation uh, 100%. Okay, that's one of the incentives for, co for communities to combine. The reality is we're funded, we get reimbursement more in the ballpark of like 65, 70%. One year they threw us a bone and they gave us 80% and then um, in the middle of the year, in January, we took a cut on that. So there's a lot of places that, unfortunately, um, we're not reaping that benefit. We're not reaping that. Um, and, and, and that sounds like it's a legislative fix. Absolutely. It? And, and, but in, in our, is our delegation working on that? So here, here's something that I am optimistic. We received an official correspondence about two weeks ago. It was signed by all four our two state reps, our two state senators, asking our regional school committee to please pass a resolution in looking at um, how the uh, House and Senate should be looking to change the funding formula. It turns out that within the last three to four years, there was a commission known as the Foundation Budget Review Commission large statewide committee of all stakeholders to look at where is the state funding formula broken, okay? And they looked at two areas that are grossly underfunded that I've talked about a lot tonight. One, special education, and two, healthcare insurance. So uh, Governor Baker <coughs> in his budget has put forward an additional billion dollars 
to be spread out over seven years, seven years, but unfortunately in the governor's plan, the overwhelming majority of the money, 80%, is going to the poorest communities, basically where there's large funding gaps. So to our credit, I think our delegation in the legislature and most, you know, and the conventional wisdom is the governor's bill is dead on arrival. Granted, we're not Worcester, we're not Lawrence, I get those pieces, but it's grossly unfair to communities like ourselves. So um, long story short, uh, my professional association, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, has a list of um, resolutions that I'm going to be bringing forward to our regional school committee and we will bring forward to our four legislators. Uh, one, I think at a bare minimum, would be every single community, no matter where you are, at a minimum would be receiving $150 guaranteed per student per year. And full implementation within a five year span, not a seven year span. So something like that. Um, if we were at, let's just say, 90% reimbursement, 90% reimbursement, I don't even want the full 100% for regional transportation, we'd be talking about picking up between an additional two hundred and fifty to $300,000. If we were at the $150 per student versus the $20 per student, we'd be talking about picking up, again, another quarter of a million dollars. So just those two changes alone, you're talking about a half a million dollars in additional state funding. So do I think that it's important? Absolutely, to advocate with our uh, local reps. Mark. Yeah, I just want to expand on that a little bit. I worked in the legislature. I actually worked for State Senator Ryan Thatman. So. Last session in July, the legislature was close to passing some sort of reform to address these funding issues. And it was literally 11.30 at night, half hour before uh, the session was gonna be done for the, for the year. Um, the House said to the Senate, this is what you need to do, pass this and we'll pass it. The Senate passed the bill sent it back to the house and they said no we're not going to do it so i think i mean there's some, there's a couple bills out there one is the governor's um, one is called the promise act which is probably the starting point for debate um, one interesting piece is that in the senate the senate chair to the education committee has changed so that's become an and the author Question. of the bill is the former. Correct. So there's a lot of discussion going on about it, and it's highly likely that the issue is going to be taken up this session. Um, it's just a matter of what is going to come what out. What is it going to look like, and what is it going to look like for our communities? Right. And I think because of the fact that the governor's bill really focuses on very few communities and yeah. helping them, the legislature is not going to pass a bill that doesn't address a broader yeah. clientele yeah. or constituency. And granted, uh, and again, I can have empathy for communities like Chelsea. Realize we're, we're in the lap of luxury compared to Chelsea. Um, but it still doesn't mean we don't have substantial challenges in giving the types of programs and services that, in my humble opinion, our kids deserve. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Anything else, Madam Chair? Uh, Jay. Well, can I ask a question to everybody else here, as opposed to you, because I talked to you enough, Joe. Yeah, you did. Um, I think one of the things that we need out of tonight is some direction from the two towns specifically, like, where are you on your funding for town services and for school services? I mean, you saw, saw three different scenarios up there. Probably none of them are really great, great options, but are any one of those options anything we should be considering? I mean, are we, I mean, are we looking at only the, the worst case scenario? Are we looking at something between that and the next level? 
or are we working at even worse than that? I mean, we haven't had a lot of feedback from the finance committees or the towns yet as to what what they can provide for the school district on a net, not forget about MLC, but just a net increase. So that would be my question to everybody out there. I mean, I'm I'm willing to jump into the deep end pretty quick. <laughs> um, I would say it's a tough question to answer right now. Um, we obviously have to vet through um, the proposed budget and all the specific requests that are coming, coming into the community. And we have to look at all the priorities and then we have to make a decision on what we want to fund above level services. Um, if we can even fund above level services right now in our community. <clears throat> so I think it's a tough question to, to answer without really finalizing our numbers and really looking at um, all those requests, priorities, and obligations that we have. Fair enough. You're not doing well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess I can speak to a certain degree. We presented our budget very early this year, so we presented a first pass of the budget on January 15th to the Board of Selectmen and to the Finance Committee. Um, both the Board and the Finance Committee have been vetting that budget with the departments and the boards and committees um, as a placeholder budget. Based upon early information, we had budgeted well, $368,000 that includes debt service um, for the school district. <coughs> Um, it was total. Oh, yeah. It was total. Gotcha. It was total. Three sixty-eight, um, and so that was the number that, that we were going by. Um, we we do have, and so I, I would say for the most part, the, we've gone through all the operational departments, um, and I can speak a little bit for the board of selectmen. All of the requests by the departments for new initiatives were declined. Um, so a very conservative budget, you know, based mostly on fixed costs. Um, no new services, no new initiatives, um, other than those things that absolutely had to be funded. Um, so we do have I, uh, some structural problems um, with our budget regarding the trash. Trash has gone up, trash recycling has gone up 30%. So that's, a, that's an increase of about $120,000 for our budget alone, and we still haven't remedied that yet. The Board of Health is working on that right now. They have an RFP right now. They're looking at different options to try to mitigate that number. Um, so those are the things I think that we're still trying to debate and learn more, more about as we now have to digest this new information. Uh, you know, I would say that these numbers are very large, as you can imagine. Right. And I guess I would also say we have not had a chance really to go through any of our you know, capital requests as well as, as Selectman Burke had mentioned. So you know, we're still relatively early in our budget process, uh, but we were looking at this year as you know, trying to be as conservative as possible because we are faced on, on, in our town with some you know, large scale capital projects. So we're trying to have this particular year um, you know, be as seamless as we can have it be based on what we're looking forward. As you gentlemen are, are dealing with a, a police station build and a large scale project like that, we have requests like that that we're looking at over the next two or three budget cycles. So it, it's a very hard question to answer. We can always go back and, you know, the, <coughs> there may not be anybody in this room now that remembers it. Well, <coughs> what are we going to do? And then, Oh, you're going to pay for trash, random right education? You know, I'm, that's just a, I mean, like I said, no, nobody knows what I'm talking about. But that's what happened. That's what happened about 25 years ago, right? I think it was before I was. I know exactly what you're talking okay. about. Okay, all right. So there's somebody here that knows what we're talking about. Yeah. Mike remembers, right? Mike was yesterday. <laughs> 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 Like I said, we're in the same boat. It's kind of early on, you know. What? I, I think. I think what would the problem here is the school committee has to say this is the number we want. 
You guys figure it out. Okay? That's why we have an elected school committee. You come up with a number, present it to the town, and see what happens. <clears throat> We're not form, at least, I'm not. I'm not formulating your budget. I don't think anybody's asking you to either. You know, I, so I think I would say as a committee, we understand what it is we have in front of us. But part of the point of this meeting is actually to put it out there so that everybody has a chance to ask the question that you need to have asked. You know, the reality is that, you know, we can answer a number of them. Joe can answer a bunch. Jay can answer a bunch. Ultimately, as a committee, I think, you know, we're going to sit down and we're going to certify a budget that we think is the right thing to do for the schools. And then you guys are going to have to come and figure out, to your point, you've always said, that what I just the said? number is the number. It is what you said. So the you number, we know the number is the number. We know what that number is. Do you guys charge any fees for any, any services or anything that you could increase? Yeah, I mean, that, that that's a realm of, um, right now at this time, what we charge fees for are our sports both at the high school and the uh, middle school. And right now we charge, what is it, Jay, $175 flat fee? $195. $195. $175. Okay, so $195 here at the high school um, and uh, $175 at the middle school. Yeah, that obviously would be in the realm of possibility, but realize with the last override, that was part of our commitment because we, used to be in a place where we had exorbitant user fees, where they'd be upwards, it was a tiered system of 375, four, four and a quarter, and 475 based upon sports. And unfortunately, um, it curtailed involvement. So if you recall my first or second slide, in talking about um, unprecedented success with regard to our sports teams, you know, I don't think it's naive to think that part of having a reasonable fee structure directly speaks to participation and involvement and, and that success piece as well. So yeah, could we increase our fees and kind of go back to the future? Yes. Is that something that we want to do for our families? No, it obviously it's not. If I just could Chairman mentioned that um, what the school committee formulated a budget and the numbers we have to figure out on our own. And, um, I guess I, I have a little hot burn with that because you know, I work with fire, police, and DPW on a regular basis, and I sat in front of each one of those department heads who who had needs as well, and and it was this board that said no to those needs given the the current position on town finances. And, and so I guess if the school committee came forward with option number one, you know, I look at it in my prior experiences in other communities that I always feel like the municipality, that side of the house, takes a back seat to the school department's needs. And so, you know, if that is the case, the school committee, I would ask that you, that you recognize the needs on our side and that, you know, whatever, budget you move forward it's a conservative budget knowing that there's no department in the town that has received the request that they asked for in this budget cycle. I think that's a very good point. The reason why we're having this meeting is to be partners with the communities. Right. Right. It's not to jam something down you guys right. down the throat of the communities. Right. So it's it's a, it's about what do we consider the priorities for the plan that we've got for the school against the plan we've got for the overall community, or what are the overall priorities we have as a set of two communities in a regional school district. So that's that's exactly the kind of thinking that we're, that we're about right now. Great, thank you. And I would say too, when we think about strategy and cooperation, right, like the spirit of this is to get everybody together and try to build some consensus before we go out to our communities and have a conversation about it. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we all think, right? We're going to all have to go to town meeting, and whatever we put forward is going to have to get passed at town meeting. And so the question is, how hard are we going to push? How many people can you get to show up at town meeting? How likely is it that whatever we put forward is going to get support? And how much heat are we going to take? Because any selectman here, any FinCon member here from either of these town knows, 
people are the people that are vocal complain about taxes. They're not coming and shaking our hands and saying, "Man, the schools are great." Right? But those are just the small number of people that we hear from. That's also a disproportionate amount of the people that show up to town meetings are the people that are complaining about taxes and worried about how much money we're spending. So again, the more aggressive we go in terms of increasing the budget, the harder people are going to have to work around this table to get people to those town meetings to support the budget. And or if we go less conservative and we go with a much smaller, you know, like an option three, then we can more safely say, you know what, we can pass this with confidence. Our constituents are going to be happy with it and it's going to be great, but then we're going to, on the other side, start to hear from a groundswell of people that start to say, hey, why are you short selling education? So there's no perfect answer, but I do respect and appreciate you know, the school committee coming forward and inviting everybody here to have the conversation, to discuss it, and to really try to put forward some options, some real, real options so people can make a decision based on facts as opposed to just hearing things through the grapevine. So, this has been a, a great session. Thank you. And, and also, I just want to bring up one effect of uh, when we're talking about those two ends of the spectrum, if you will, of, of spending now, spending less now, whatever that spectrum looks like. If we go with, with something that we think will be passed by the money conscious people within our towns, we need to recognize that that problem starts to propagate into the following years pretty rapidly. And we'll end up getting into situations that are even more desperate later on. Great. So I, I just want to add that dynamic to the discussion. And that goes on both sides, though, if you really look about it. On, on the municipal side, obviously, we have our operational budget. So it, it compounds on both sides, yeah, okay. if, you, if you really think about it. You know, it's our job as selectmen, as FinCon members, to <coughs> understand the movement of our community, right? And we have to make sure that we're good stewards to the budgets and, you know, we're um, protecting the interests of our communities. So that's the biggest challenge that we have with small communities like ours. We only have X amount of revenue that comes into the community. And we don't have a huge commercial base. So the only way to do it is really drive it through residential taxes. And until we can get more economic stimulus within our communities, we're always going to be you know, kind of shoveling it against the tide, if you know what I mean, and trying to catch up. So I think that you know it's a hard job, but we have to make sure that we're moving our communities forward in the right direction on all fronts. Is there, is there some um, future projection for town budgets or reduction in expenses, things that may be coming off the books for the both communities that would increase our ability to catch up at some year in the future? Well, I mean, obviously, every fit come, uh, I'm sure on both sides, um, uh, are obviously looking at our board uh, going finances and seeing if there's debt dropping off or if there's any opportunities that we can use to catch up. Um, how you do that um, strategically and also looking at your, all your capital expenditures going forward, you know, that's, that's a challenge. It's a juggling act. Um, obviously, the school's a major um, contributor to the budget. Um, we have to be conscious of that. We have to make sure that we're making good decisions. But we can't ignore all the <coughs> other things going on in town as well. To that point about debt dropping off and things coming off the books, and, you know, the list is so long on our end of what we need to do. Recently, we had debt drop, and we right. used that to backfill for the police station. Right. So there's always something else, and the list is quite lengthy of what is going to replace the debt when it does drop off and looking for another debt exclusion to fill that gap and move forward. Well, that's, in a sense, that's a discussion about priorities. And when you, when you have that, that understanding of what your priorities are, then putting them into the proper slots within within the schedule becomes the discussion instead of being kind of undefined at this point. Yeah, and I think the other, what is slightly See, different, yeah, what, what is slightly different though is we're talking about with like a police station, a debt exclusion is not permanent increase. Whereas when we look back at you know operational overrides, which are rarely passed, amended at least, um, those are forever. So. Yeah. They're somewhat different, but, and there's more of an appetite to in that into past steps. We're, we're actually needing to go back in May, and on the ballot, there will be 
a debt exclusion for more money for the police station project. So if that fails, if that fails, we have to take that out operationally. Right. We've already planned for that. Um, but that's those are decisions that we have to make to be able to move our community forward. So another, another thing people really want to think about too is you know if we take a bigger bite out of the apple this year, does that help us put a, put off an override? another year or two years, or are we still going to be looking at an override? Because if we can spread that out, I think that's a lot more appetizing to people to sort of take a take a chunk this year, take a chunk the year after, take a chunk the year after, as opposed to, you know, sort of starving us, starving us, starving us, override, starving, yeah. starving, override, start because the override's what gets a hell of a lot more attention and creates a much bigger issue, you know, than a higher than average increase, which is what this clearly would be. It's not an override, and that's clearly the flashpoint for a lot of these communities and a lot of these towns folks. I'm not sure that any of these numbers we can do without an override. Yeah, I, I have to say that, that when you talk about uh, making priorities in the budget, you know, we're at a point right now where you know, we've essentially done the same thing that Upton has done to all of the asks that everybody has asked for in all of the municipal departments. We told them, no, we can't. And we were waiting for these numbers and waiting for ballot text numbers, you know, to look at how everything else is going to shake out. And, you know, the idea that we'll take a bite each year and then override, well, this is pretty much an ongoing thing for us. And that's why we made a big push with the legislature, but there are only four out of 40 in the Senate and four times as much in the House. And, um, you know, I would encourage. I think one thing everybody here could do is call your legislatures, call the governor's office, and tell them just what Joe said, that yeah, I understand that there are inner cities that have issues, but you know we've been, we've been paying an awful lot um, to everybody else for a while. And then the other thing, you know, we did just, I'm not sure what Upton's situation is, you know, we did put a, a cannabis zoning area in, and, and you know, there's other sources of additional revenue, which a lot of people don't want that, but you know, it's dollar bills, and we need it. That's not, we need to come up with more revenue somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, so so we're trying to be creative and look at other issues, but it really is, um, you know, that we're all we feel like puppets, and Beacon Hill is pulling all the strings, and every time we make you know effort in a certain direction, well, then they increase their share that much more. So, you know, until I guess we get to that point, we're always going to be playing this game. And it's great that we're all together to <coughs> commiserate, but we're all in the same place, yeah. you know? I, I would also say that you know, our, our strategy um, over the last probably seven years is to be uh, pretty conservative and rebuild our community. Because if you recall, we decimated our community about six years ago. I'm not sure if you were around or not, but we. We decimated our community pretty bad. We cut a lot of services, um, and we had to do a lot of clawing out of that um, just to get back to level service. Um, and we've done some rebuilding, and we've had a lot of capital that's been really deferred, et cetera. And the way that we did that is we were extremely strategic, and we were extremely nimble in order to get this accomplished. Um, so hits like this, I was just whispering in Joe's ear, I mean, a hit of a $500,000 or a million bucks to mend is going to decimate us again. Yeah. You know, we're in the middle of contract negotiations with our unions. You know, we have a ton of deferred maintenance, a ton of you know, deferred capital, you know, that we have to catch up on. You know, yeah. and we want to support the school. Obviously, the schools are important. We've done an outstanding job. We supported the override four years ago. We were hoping to get five, you know, before we start getting this big hits again. But I just don't know where the money's going to come from right now because we only have X amount of revenue coming in, you know, and every year it seems like they're just, you know, adjusting our minimal local contribution and we get what? <laughs> you know, so it's just how can you how can you make up five hundred grand when you only get two hundred thousand dollars in new growth or whatever it is? So you know so now Jay's getting the feedback you wanted. So sorry, but so let me just add to what Chris just said though. I think it was He gets lots of feedback. <laughs> I, I do, I get yeah, it all the time. Yeah. Um, 2010, 2011, I think the school district over those two years probably had to reduce from level services by five or six million dollars. We decimated the school district as well and we have built it back up, mostly through a fairly substantial override. 
four years ago. Because again, we understand, it's not like you guys have money growing on trees that you can just hand it out. I think as a school district, we want to avoid that yo-yo effect of we go up to here, get your legs cut off, you go right back down again, people flee the district just so we can try and build it up again. I don't know how you create stability without increasing revenue to the communities, because really you're our source of revenue. Um, so I think unfortunately you have to look at the you know that state mandated two and a half percent that we always argue about, which is come hell or high water, you really have to stick to those numbers. And it just doesn't unless you have some large influx of maybe it's new growth, maybe it's uh, tax revenue from cannabis, or maybe it's you have a project that gets built and you have some uh, you know real influx of new capital or new cash flow. Otherwise, we are all stuck living within this two and a half percent each and every year, unfortunately. And, and again, we were talking, or you were talking about the state. The state's pointing the finger at regional districts or what we may be considered maybe a more affluent district in comparison with the Lawrences and the Chelsea's. So they are not holding up their end of the bargain. We're not getting that transportation money that we should right. be. No, it's, it's definitely a promise not kept, Steve. Exactly. Definitely a promise not kept. So, in, and then, so I guess to that end is that fifty-five hundred dollar figure, or some of the numbers that we have to pay out, like you said, with regard to special ed students that we pay for their uh, tuition out of district. Those numbers just don't seem like they're fair, so to say. You know, we receive fifty-five hundred dollars, let's just say, for an incoming student, yet we may have to pay an outgoing tuition of thirty thousand or. Well, to be clear, that's that's a little bit of the apples and oranges in the sense that the choice, what, what, what I was describing with choice, these are just students that aren't necessarily special ed students. The 31 students that I was talking about, those high tuition, Steve, these are kids with some significant disabilities. They might have multiple disabilities that they need highly specialized programming. So these are students that are uh, going to places like the Perkins School for the Blind or the New England Center where you've got students that have you know, multiple disabilities or different schools for students that have you know, significant mental health challenges. Those are those very costly out of district tuitions that we are mandated. Yeah. But at the same time, there could be circuit breaker monies or other things. That well, that's that, again uh, to my other <laughs> unkept promise. Right. Uh, it, you know, and we've had this conversation in the past, Mike, at the FinCom level. The de facto reimbursement rate through circuit breaker comes out to be in the ballpark of about thirty to forty percent of state funding, and then as a result we're on the hook for about 60 to 70 percent and again you know Jay and I look at the numbers if I had to average the tuition what would you say it's probably average 60 yeah. 70 thousand I mean I can tell you we for the 31 students we're projected to spend about two and a half million dollars for their tuition alone not transportation of which we'll get back maybe seven hundred thousand well, in reimbursement even no for baggage because it's out of district tuition is much greater yes. right, than Correct. the district. And Correct. I know there was a discussion about normalizing that tuition across the whole state. Correct. You know? Correct. And but even if they normalize the, the price for technology schools is still higher. Oh sure they are. But I mean but it's <coughs> but like we just threw out a half a dozen different things yep. that could happen legislatively on the state level, but you've got, you know, Four four members of of the you know of a of a whole state house, and it's very easy to forget about the Blackstone Valley because they just always do, you know. But not that that's solving the problem, but it's kind of defining it a little bit. Just uh, one more point uh, to what Jay was saying about the yo-yo effect. I mean, I, I totally agree. Obviously, we don't want the, the string to roll all the way out, but that doesn't mean that it's going to stay. That yo-yo is going to stay up in hand either. It has to be a balance somewhere, and it's what can the community support. And I think that there's going to have to be a consensus about that because we can't start infighting in between the two communities of, well, Upton can afford this, or Mendon can afford this, 
and then we get a 60-40% uh, split, and now some we're fighting about who's going to pay what. You know, that's, I think that we're going to have to have some sort of consensus on what the communities can afford, and you know, and that's what it is. So the yo-yo the yo -yo doesn't get all the way up. I think that's going to be a big, str a big struggle. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. Are, are, that, that sounds like a very good point, right? So is there a discussion that, that you guys can have as a town to inform us in what budget we should be served by? In place for us. Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, Chris, Sean, Sean, Chris, and here's a new slash. You live in the same town. I'm just one of these. He's a good guy. Sean, Chris is a good guy. The short answer is yes. The both you know, the FinCom has been been working, <coughs> and, in, and the selectmen are meeting next week, um, and we've got the numbers from Valley Tech now, so we should be able to to come up with a number very soon. Mike, just out of curiosity, what happened to your Valley Tech numbers? Because was, <clears throat> we lost nine more kids. We've lost like 20 something kids in two years. Mm. So we're, we're down like 80, 84,000, something like yeah. that. Well, we were told, I was told today by, uh, by Mike Fitzpatrick that uh, our number was gonna drop about 18,000 because so we're down done. four students. But you know, that's, that's not a perfect because can go up again, it depends on what the state says. What you know, what can we afford? And Upton and Minden is not always the same. No. Certainly, it's all 13 <coughs> towns are different. Yeah. But it's kind of like it's a mystery sometimes, well, you're, right? You're, you're talking about values. The, the, the driver is the, the is the value of the town and all yeah. that. Right. Well, not we, not just that. no no we 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 got a, a 57 unit subdivision. They're all. Uh, it's people that are downsizing from Newton and Wellesley. Mm -hmm. These houses are going from 587 to over 650,000. There's one kid up there, all right? So, so you're rolling in the money. <laughs> no, well, we get, you're getting a couple of dollars, but all that, <coughs> excuse me, yes. all that housing is driving up the total value of the town. Right. Which is right. which is driving up that minimum local that, contribution that number. Right. You have, they think you have more revenue, but the state offsets it, so yeah. you're at, it's actually a net decrease because now you've got to pay more, and the state's giving you. I mean, it, and, and how good goes on punished? Yeah, our two and a half percent in new growth was around seven hundred thousand dollars. You know, so I mean, even your option three consumes. 90% of our new growth in two and a half percent. So you know, that goes back to that point. Of what's left over for the DPW? You know, that, if that's the case, then you know, we'd, be looking, we'd be looking at laying off public safety and public works officials. Just to answer your question, Paul, I, I, I just pulled up the spreadsheet. Um, yeah. We've lost the official October 1st enrollment numbers. There's 16 fewer students in total between our two communities uh, accessing BBT. Uh, Upton, you've gone from 102 students to 91, so that is a loss of 11. 11 yeah. And Menden, you've gone from 84 to 79, so that's a loss of five. You told me four. <coughs> just be quick, I'm not in the first time. We picked up those 20 something kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we went through that process. We did. We went through that process <coughs> back right around Joe, the time you started. And well, we all well, know. Maybe about five years ago, we, had, we jumped yeah. 26. Yeah. No, the reason. We we'll take the reason being is the quality here you improve that much so you're not having the kids late. Exactly. That's right. And why did the quality <coughs> why did the quality improve here? Because you spent the money. You paid the money. Yeah, you passed it over right fairly substantially. Yeah. So I think I, I mean I'll say I think we hear both sides and we understand what you're dealing with. I mean, our point isn't just to create a fictitious number and say, right. woo, you know, lollipops and whatever. I mean, and, and we have some work to do, I think, on our side to just kind of come back and look at the different options and figure out what's the right path forward. I mean, but we do, part of the point of this meeting, I think we've heard it now very clearly, is, you know, where the towns at, what do the towns really have, what are the different pressure points and what's happening. So I think, you know, we will take that into consideration and look at that. And I think this conversation will, you know, obviously continue on. It's not going to get resolved tonight. 
I would love the state to do many things. Right. Like when I joined the committee, we were all talking about we're going to write letters to the state, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we do all that, and we continue to do all that. But those things you know, you know as well as I know, take years. Yes, they do. And you know, we can let we can let Rome burn around us. So yeah. Well, you know, when you can get advocates there, mm -hmm. they do a lot of work year year over year over year, and then there's a, there's a change in the committees and who's there, and then the priority shift. You know, we have to start all over again. <coughs> all right, are there further points of strategy cooperation? I, I that was a question, Madam Chairman. Had you read? <coughs> well, <coughs> yeah, no, I'll figure it out. <coughs> We got a couple of EMTs here. At the time meetings, both times approved a, 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 a stabilization account for the district. What's happened to that? It's sitting there to be used for capital projects at some point in the future. It's one of those things that I would tell you you shouldn't use for one-time funds. I'm not. I'm not advocating that. I'm just asking account. how much is there and how much do you want this pay? How much more are you figuring you're going to get out of this? Because you're like, what, two or three years behind on the reimbursement? Uh, no, no, that was it. 667000 I went. It was 337 twice, so what's that? 675. That's sitting in account. That's it. We're all done. There's no more reimbursements. Oh, you've got all your money. Yeah, we got it all. <clears throat> it's been set aside already, and it's there. And, you know, as we start to look at some of our capital needs, quite honestly, our capital list is around $12 million. Uh, so it's, that's a drop in the bucket, but it will address <coughs> short-term emergency needs. We. You know, I talk about this at school committee all the time. We have been inundated this year with issues with our heating system, specifically well, in this I, I don't want I don't want to sound like a skunk at the lawn party here, but you just said you got twelve million dollars worth of capital, right? Yeah. When are you gonna start doing something about that? Because that's only gonna get bigger. Well, where are we gonna get the <laughs> money from, Paul? We gotta go to get debt excluded. Well, so it, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, saying it's, it's it's all part of the same right. picture. So we have debt. It's all part of the same off. picture from the school district in 2024, and I would think that at that point you'd be seeing a capital debt exclusion for to address a lot of needs throughout the district to replace that debt. That's what I would project. As long as it's a debt exclusion. Yeah. But I'm not the one that makes those decisions either. So. Oh, I understand that. But I'm saying <coughs> it would be this cool. capital issue. Yeah, it's not going away. You're right. It's not going away. If I may, I would just suggest uh, from the Upton side of the table that at a future date we may want to have a joint meeting between FinCom, School Committee, and Board of Selectmen. That may be the next thing that may be helpful to give us a chance to kind of digest all these numbers. We are, I'm sure we'll all have more questions and we can meet and discuss that if that's uh, amicable to all. Yeah, that works. Okay. Well, when's, the, when's the budget? When's your budget? Oh, March 11th. March 11th. So that's only 10 or 11 days away. Yeah, right. But like so, Joe said, we can certify a budget that we can always bring along. So. Right, so next steps so, on the school district side um, include a budget subcommittee meeting on March 7th, <coughs> and then we will have the open budget hearing on March 11th. We'll also be working on that resolution and communication with the legislators um, with the concerns that we have. Do you think that's, is that sufficient for meetings? Do, did you want to make a motion for an additional meeting? Or? Steve? We could, uh, well, I was going to have that. Yeah, that would be, again, just the three up and boards getting together. So we could do that on our side. Good. Steve, we have a joint meeting for the second pin call on March 13th. It sounds that that may be late, but that's already pre scheduled joint meeting on the 13th of March. Okay, maybe we can uh, invite the school committee to that? <coughs> All right, anything further on next steps? But, but by then, to, to, to Mr. McDaniel's point, by then they've already voted the budget. We will. But we can always go lower. You keep saying that. We can always go, well, you can't go higher. Can't go higher, that's what I was told. Taught me early.
Okay, next item on the agenda is public comments. Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard or address the, the chair at this point? Okay, hearing none. Um, any last words or I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It's been fairly productive, if not sobering. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you, I'm sure, in future meetings. Um, we need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meetings adjourned. Somebody needs to get a packet. It's a pressure.